Oh, hello again, everyone. Welcome back once again, and um, thanks for visiting. So here I am today at the Fleet Air Arm Museum in uh, Yeovilton. Uh, I'm in Hall 2, and I think no prizes for guessing what I'm looking at here today. Anybody that's been following any of my projects, and if you haven't, please do, um, will know that I'm looking at a Corsair. So forgive me, I haven't got Steadicam today. I've got Unsteadicam instead. Um, I've been enormously fortunate um, on this day to have with me Dave Morris. Uh, Dave Morris was um, pretty much in charge of the project to restore KD431, which is what we're looking at today, to the condition in which you see it. Um, and for those of you who can't get along to the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Yeovilton, there is a book that you can read about this. It's called um, KD1, uh, KD431. Yeah, um, Corsair. It's definitely worth looking at. David Morris is the author um, and it contains within it a host of really, really excellent pictures showing you um, the, shall we say, modern day archaeology uh, of this particular aircraft um, and how they arrived at the conclusions of, of where this aircraft came from. So. Um, I want to give him a big shout out for this and say thanks very much to him for this, but also I have his book and I think it's extremely worthwhile um, that, you, that you take a look at this as well. There's a second edition, so when you buy this, make sure you buy the late edition because it contains some updates that are really quite important. So, um, without further ado, let's, let's just walk towards this. And as I come towards it, the first thing that tends to stand out is really the size of this aircraft. Um, you'll remember from my video on JG668, which was the Mark 8 Spitfire down in Pembroke, that I was stood next to this. This is a mammoth aircraft by comparison. It's absolutely enormous. Um, and it's got a very, uh, a, a very uh, distinctive design, the cranked wings. You can see them folded here. Um, and on the starboard side, you can see the jury strut that was placed into the aircraft here to um, steady the wings and stop them from falling down as a safety measure. That's that red bar there. Um, but let's look at the front of the aircraft. So um, the propeller itself is a Hamilton Standard Hydromatic propeller, three blade in this particular variant. The later variants of the Corsair had four bladed propellers but moved to a slightly more powerful engine as well. And the engine is um, an R2800-8 uh, radial engine. It's called a double wasp. Now, um, the first thing to really point out here is that the inside of the cowling, which people don't see very often, is in fact painted matte white. And it's painted matte white about as far as those struts go backwards. Uh, you can see there's a, there's a round section there. It looks like it's um, the zinc chromate yellow after that. I suspect that's right. I think it's zinc chromate yellow. Yeah, it would have been a chromate from uh, yeah. so, further in. Yeah. So Goodyear will have painted these aircraft just like Chance Fort did, a chromate yellow on the inside. We'll be able to see that uh, in more detail in a, in a little bit. So the double wasp is a Pratt & Whitney engine. Um, it's a, an 18 cylinder um, engine. And, Again, this gives us the opportunity to see the, uh, the ignition um, circuitry there, which are the, are the wires that poke out from the middle. I can't really point this out because I've got the camera up at a fairly significant height now, to be honest, it's about sort of seven or eight feet. It gives us the opportunity to take a look at the final drive, the gearbox there, and the magneto on the one side here. And if we move around to the other side, there's the other magneto there. And there's some um, gubbins in the middle there, which I don't know what that is, to be honest with you. The, uh, the black box in the middle, I think it's probably something to do with electrics and distribution, I would say. Um, and you can see, of course, the, the spinner detail there. Um, and obviously we can see some sort of wear on that there. As we move down the propeller, we can start to see some, some signs of wear there. There are some scratches that you can see down here. Those are written into the book, by the way. There's quite a long piece on that in the book. So um, there was quite a lot of, of uh, detective work done by the people who were restoring the aircraft. Um, and um, it's, it's really definitely worthwhile taking a look at that. So, um, so if we go now a little bit further down and we start to look at the cowling. So we can see the cowling um, sections here. There are four of them, two on this side and then two on the other side. They are numbered, so they can be put in in the wrong way. And the restorers, when they did um, start to restore this, what they were doing, by the way, is removing paintwork 
from the outside of these um, uh, of these panels to expose the original paint. So this is actually original paint that was applied in the in the mid 40s um, or mid to early 40s actually at the Goodyear factory. Um, and what we can see if we look up in the light here is you can see the um, the, the designation number of the aircraft. You can see 431, and this is KD 431. So um, those cowling panels were put in properly by the team and that exposed that which um, had any other work or any other type of archaeological work been done to uh, remove the paint you might have missed those so as we see going a little further back we can look now at the at the cowling flaps as you can see these are very very thin um, so if, you, if you're building models particularly at 148 you're going to have to thin that plastic down a great deal uh, you can also see the, the spring-loaded um, flap openers here um, and we can see that that's quite oily but white on the inside by the look of things from what I can see and we can see that down there so that's really quite interesting that brings us a little bit further back here into the exhaust pipe areas so we can look up in here and see those these exhaust pipes are angled to give extra thrust to the aircraft as it flies which is always an extremely useful thing to have you may remember that Mustang P-51s used to have that as well. They said it added about 15 miles an hour to the top speed. As we move further under, we can see that this aircraft doesn't have any pylons fitted to it. So there, are no, there are no pylons here. So if you're building an American um, type aircraft from, for example, Tamir, Tamir, depending on where you come from in the world, you'll be able to note that, um, there are, that, you'll, that you'll not need to put in those, those pylons. So, these are the catapult hooks here. You can see they're slightly worn, but they're very, very strong, of course, as you would imagine. And there is something there which I believe to be a bomb hook, but I'm, you know, I can be, I can be corrected on that one. So um, you won't see much in the way of, of wear and tear in terms of exhaust fumes and so on and so forth going back here. But one thing it is possible to see is this is all done in the glossy sea blue, uh, and you can, um, and you can certainly observe that. So. Moving up into the, um, the wing area here, into the wing root. So the wing root is, is placed more or less at right angles to the circular part of the fuselage here, which makes actually installing this rather easier. Um, but um, it's, it has disadvantages in other ways. And if we look further upwards here, we can now see um, plenum chambers and various other bits and pieces. And again, you can see clearly the zinc chromate yellow that's used here. That's, I think, quite useful there, and this panel's been left off deliberately to be able to show people that. Um, so let's move back down again. In here we have the supercharger cooling ducts, so the supercharged engine would need to have those superchargers cooled, and these are oil coolers. There's one on each side, so port and starboard, and this allows us then to keep the oil cool as well as this aircraft is herring along at approximately 400 miles an hour because remember the Corsair was one of the fastest um, to prop aircraft of the Second World War uh, and um, as such you know was extremely powerful and extremely useful in gaining height and altitude. Let's move on. So um, we can now start to look at the undercarriage and, and there are some points to be made here that are quite important. First things first, the undercarriage is not coloured green or chromate coloured glossy sea blue once again as you can see it's been restored away and up inside the undercarriage wells we can see there is some pipe work but very little of it is actually coloured aluminium um, very little of it indeed in fact and and there's much less detail in here than you would think um, I, I imagined that there would be more but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of here and then come back from that direction and look forwards and, and see if we can show you this from here as well. I'm crawling around underneath this aircraft now and as we look up inside I think you might just about be able to make that out. Sorry I just fell over then. So let's see if we can, uh, there we go as the light adjusts we can see the, um, we can see the undercarriage jacks there, that's the uh, diagonal part there onto the undercarriage door and there's an undercarriage jack on the on the right there. So you'll be able to um, mimic those if you wish to. Um, and then you've got the um, hydraulic distribution pipes there, which you can put in. And again, note that they are all sea blue. So the inside of this is sea blue with the exception 
of that canvas panel there which is folded down in this case and could be folded up normally so um, this is really again very interesting so the instructions on a Tamiya aircraft for example won't be correct for a fleet air arm aircraft so oh dear I'm still old enough or I have to make that noise when I get up so there we are one final look at the at the undercarriage here something's not included in the in the model aircraft is this spring here so as I've mentioned before, we can make a spring for this, um, for this aircraft um, and we can do that from thin, um, generally use um, multi-core speaker wire, use one of those because anything bigger is going to be um, quite out of scale. And note that there is one spring on this side, there doesn't seem to be one on that side, but there is supposed to be. Anyway, there we are. Um, hydraulic pipe work going down here, clipped in above the scissor jack here and then around to the bottom here and in and then we have a, um, a towing um, shackle here and then there is another pipe moving upwards here that goes upwards and then behind the undercarriage door here and then sits up into this ganglion here so that's an important bit of extra detail again a thin wire here not quite sure what that is but I think that um, needed to be carefully guarded. So port and starboard undercarriage are both the same. So as you can see, the wings are folded here. Um, I'll have a quick look at these ports here. You can see that they're colored red around the surrounding of them. Um, and there are no guns in this, um, but there would have been. And there are some stencilings there. So remove tape before firing. That seems sensible to me. Um, because, uh, yes, well, why not? Danger, do not work on wings. So these are all pretty much original um, original stencils and markings from, from the day. Um, this section here is aluminium. Further up, as you can see, the colour changes and there's some ribbing there. That's canvas. So in, in the Second World War, um, Chance Vought, Goodyear and so on, were looking to reduce, where possible, the amount of... Um, uh, of, of aluminium they were using and this was the way for doing this. You can also see the roundel there um, and in some parts of this aircraft this canvas sheeting has been removed. So uh, there we are. So now we can look just quickly into the into the split here where the uh, where the wings fold. I didn't think we were going to get the opportunity to see this but I'm delighted that we are so just we'll, we'll move across here and again we can see all of the uh, of, of the stenciling here um, we can see some of the, the marking in the zinc chromate yellow here, but all of this again is, is um, sea blue um, and there's very little in the way of aluminium or, or, or metal coloured um, bits and pieces here. So um, it's, it's worthwhile noting that. Um, and even, for example, Briggs Manufacturing Company. So you can see these original, um, original um, logos and, and things here. So. The flaps here, they're covered in, I'm not going to touch them again, they're covered in material um, and uh, the flap deflection here I would estimate to be probably 50 degrees, am I about right with that? Is it maximum deflection do you think? Mm. I would need to check the pilot's notes or, yeah. or the selector in the cockpit. Yeah. So the, the, I mean the, in terms of the flap deflection options um, for this aircraft it can be between 10 degrees and 50 degrees. 50 degrees is quite important because it allows the aircraft to be um, faced as much nose down as possible when landing on an aircraft carrier because it's the equivalent I think of landing on a postage stamp um, and um, you don't want to do that um, with without due care and attention. Um, on the larger scale Tamiya models or, or others or trumpeters and so on you might want to think about hollowing out these sections here which indeed would be visible when you've got the when, the, when you've got the wings folded so we'll just take another look at that. Now as we come to the wing tops here and the wing backs and the flaps and so on we can now start to see some examples of the weathering and the wearing that we're likely to encounter. And also we can see the walk strips here. So these are black with a slightly rough texture to the feel. I won't touch that anymore. Remember, this is a modern day antique we're looking at. It's unique in the world, really. Um, and what you can see here is there's um, no real way of actually getting into the aircraft from 
the port side, which is quite unlike a, a Spitfire, for example, or a Hurricane, where you would enter the aircraft from the port side because you had a folding down door up there. This is a different aircraft, of course, um, and the pilot would gain entry from the other side. So we'll, we'll take a look at that presently. So again, we can see the roundel here. Um, it's um, sighted more or less immediately below the, um, the canopy in its furthest rearward position. Um, and uh, there's a unique feature which you might want to put on. This is a ventilation hole. Now, um, the back of the cockpit behind the pilot's seat, there was on most of these aircraft what's called a carbon monoxide curtain, which is a canvas curtain. This one doesn't have one. It was taken out at some stage, I gather. Again, you'll find details of that in Dave Morris's excellent book, um, available at good bookshops everywhere. Um, but this allowed ventilation to be brought into the cockpit to prevent any carbon monoxide poisoning on the part of the, um, on the, part of the pilot. Um, so we can see the markings here, which are what is left of the marking. So KD431 was E2M, but originally was E2S. So you can see here, we have a, a visible S. Just uh, to see and S. E, E2M came later, it was just ah. it was coded S. Yeah, yeah on uh, 1835 squadron and then when it left and went to 768 squadron uh, coded E2M. So we've played with the blending of the kind of conservation restoration process there to show both of the, the, the letters that were in position at that point. We didn't want to lose either one. No, they were fantastic. both valuable historically. So the aircraft was coded S in a white letter originally changed to pale blue when it was intending to go to Southeast Asia Command, which yeah. it never quite made it. Uh, again, all of that's documented in the book. Um, and then after 1835 squadron, uh, it goes to a second line squadron, uh, East Haven, which was coded then E2M. So again, all of that explanation is, is written up. Fantastic. It, it's, it's a slightly complex story as to why we've ended up leaving two sets of almost superimposed markings on, on the aircraft. But when you see the other side and see the markings um, are the same, it's an E2 and an M, but the font styles are completely different on opposite sides of the airplane. Yeah, you begin yeah. to really understand how this aircraft was perhaps painted by two individuals on the same day right. at speed, yeah. under wartime conditions. Sure. You know, it, it, it isn't laid out as precisely as you might see a carefully repainted and rebuilt aircraft all marked out very, yeah. very accurately. This is done at speed on the squadron on the day. Yeah. And that's captured that little bit of unique history on, on this aircraft. And, and, and of course, thank you, Dave, very much. Um, it is unique um, because, of course, the restoration exposed the fact that um, the E2 and the M and S were actually placed in the wrong places when this aircraft was repainted, I believe, in the, in the 50s or 60s. Yes, again, yeah. it's, it's a typical of a 1960s, 70s um, repaint and a refinish to go on display into a museum. Um, and that's very, very typical of, of, of that 60s, 70s period. People were not necessarily stopping and thinking about the deeper historic detail of the markings they were perhaps overpainting, and that's something with this paint archaeology process that we've that we've achieved sure. is is re looking at that in great great detail and going Absolutely. back and finding that original and trying to re -expo expose and preserve that original. Yeah. So it, it's this everybody that I think that is is so important about the Fleet Air Arm Museum that they seek wherever they possibly can to preserve the air of authenticity about this, to make it as real as it can possibly be. So it is a genuinely um, an archaeological expedition, if you like, to make certain that for future generations who come to look at this in years to come, they see exactly as it would have looked at the time. So I I'm, thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. If I hop back to the wing, I noticed you yes, were on the wing yes, earlier, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at this mark here, again, indicative of, of what we try and achieve with this, what we call paint archaeology and the way we go in very, very, very deep detail, inch by inch, trying to expose and find the completely original, authentic witness marks, markings, details, which still exist. If, if, if you, you know, look at your object, doesn't have to be a Corsair, it can be anything of course, but if you look at your object in real fine, thoughtful detail, 
you can very often capture these very interesting pieces of past history. This grubby line here is original from when the aircraft crossed the Atlantic in 1944. So as exposed deck cargo, this area would be bagged in with a, with a fabric, doped in fabric, oh, yes. um, yeah. protective band, just to stop salt spray getting into this, this detailed area of the wing fold. And that would have been picked and cut and torn away as soon as the aircraft arrived in Great Britain and put into service. But that's still the grubby, dirty line on both sides, on the wing and around the air intakes and around the exhaust uh, parts oh, of the fantastic. engine. Yeah. That still exists from, uh, as far as we can determine, the 11th of November 1944 when it arrived um, in Great Britain. Uh, very soon after that would have been peeled away and that evidence is still there from that date point in 1944. If you wipe that over with thinners or a paint stripper or washed it away that would be gone but we've managed to actually find that and retain it preserve it and use it as date provable evidence for the study of the i'm aircraft. almost afraid to touch it now actually <laughs> <laughs> but look i mean that again that's precisely the evidence if, if you ever needed it that this is an authentic piece of, of uh, modern day archaeology it's quite fantastic to discover those fine those fine little details and although I've read the book that didn't impinge upon me so we're very fortunate to have Dave along here today to be able to help us with that so what we'll do is we'll quietly move along towards the rear of the aircraft on the on the port side here um, we can see um, the the identification marking here so um, a word about identification markings. There was an identification marking which the um, Goodyear factory put onto the side of the aircraft, which was on the front of the cowling back there that you could you could see the 431. There was also an American what's called bureau number, and that bureau number has been located across these um, across these aircraft. So if we look into the back here again, the rear undercarriage here, the the tail wheel, it's a castering tail wheel, but can be locked. So. When it's not locked, it will move through 360 degrees, and when it is locked, it has a, a, a degree of movement. Um, there's me doing the movement there, and you can see the arrestor hook there. Um, it's not coloured um, black and yellow, it's simply dark blue. Um, and again, looking back inside there, you can see that that is in fact um, the chromate internal colour by the look of it to me. Let's see if we can get in there and, and see that. Yeah, that's zinc chromate yellow slightly darker I would imagine than perhaps the Tamiya colouring but again you can see this here I'm just going to move backwards I don't want to do too much movement because it may change the orientation of the camera so let's move back that way I'm trying not to knock my head as well so as you can see there um, that gives you I think some additional detail there so we'll move away from the tail now and try not to bash my head on the on the horizontal stabiliser here so as we move around, again, we can see marks and little scrapes and bumps and so on. And once again, it's a 400 mile an hour aircraft, everybody. And it has um, fabric elevators and fabric rudder and fabric ailerons. And they're made of wood as well. I think that's fabulous. That's fantastic. So um, two things to look at here. We have a trim tab. So the aircraft is trimmed in all three axes in the pitching plane, which is up and down, down the length of the aircraft, the rolling plane with the ailerons, and the yaw plane with the rudder. Uh, and we'll show you those, because we will be going into the cockpit. Hey, what about that? Um, so you have a, a, a trim tab here, and this, I think, I think I've got this right, this is the balance tab. So when the rudder or elevator, and, and it's the same for the aileron as well, is deflected down, this tab deflects upwards and allows you to be able to move the stick more easily um, at high speeds. Some of you will know that the P51D Mustang has a similar thing, but this is very useful for high level aircraft um, that, are, that are flying very, very quickly because the, the aircraft becomes much more difficult to control because the air becomes like a solid thing at that sort of speed. Um, so it's worthwhile knowing that there's a trim tab there um, and then a, a um, a balance tab to be able to help the pilot to fly the aircraft and of course fight it um, at very high speeds. Um, you can see the, um, the uh, connection bars here for the, for the trimming um, and also um, in other areas you can see these things as well. Um, 
as you can, as you will know on the 148th scale model for those of you that have watched my video on the 148th tail this I've I've added in as a piece of wire and you can do that and on the 132 I think that you can do that you'll be able to do that as well if you want to do that it's a pretty simple job but as you can see this is quite small this is no no bigger than than the width of my finger here um, so it's it's a small um, piece of kit there so it's definitely worth taking a look at that in terms of the detailing so we have um, aluminium top here and then fabric here I won't touch that anymore I don't want to touch that at all actually because um, it's um, it's 80 odd years old and as we move across around the uh, and we move around to the front here of the of the tailplane and we look up to the to the rudder up there you can see it's a, it's a large rudder that's that's really quite big um, and, it, and it fits across a junction at the top to a horizontal then to a vertical and then to a horizontal and you can see the gap there is reasonably pronounced between the, the fuselage main body um, and the uh, and the rudder, and you can in fact pretty much see through that bit there. Although there's the big connection bar there. So, okay. Roger, I'm just going to bring you back while you're looking at the tail. Yeah, okay. Um, it's, it's, it's something which we found very very interesting when we were looking at the paint and doing the paint removal on the tail to get back to the original Goodyear glossy sea blue, but of course. You can see there now underneath is a green camouflage upper surface oh, so can, and yes. a sky under surface. Wow. And Goodness. also a slate grey camouflage portion there. So we've got a, a slate grey and, and an olive green upper portion with a sky underneath. And if we come back to this side on the port side tail plane, you'll see the same and you can also see the remnants of um, a US Navy blue colour showing through there underneath. Let's see if we can give that. There we go, look, we can see that in the light there. What about that? Because otherwise, that it's difference reflecting. in colour yeah, there between the glossy the sea blue and the, and the US Navy mid, mid colour blue. This puzzled us a lot when we were doing the paint archaeology. Um, and finally, we, we, we've proven and it's taken a long time and it's taken input from other Corsair owners in the United States rebuilding their aircraft and kindly sending me bits of information and bits of research material um, which we've finally proven that this is such an early built Goodyear aircraft um, in the Akron factory in, in Ohio that they were actually using up Brewster parts from the closed oh. Brewster factory. The oh. factory is closed in Long Island in June 1944. By the time they're building um, FG1As uh, for, for the British Navy at the Goodyear plant, they're using up components that were assessed to be um, still suitable and good enough to use in, 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 in production, shipping them up to Ohio. And I know we, we, we say it, I'm gonna show you the book again. Of course, yes, um, of course. We keep referring to the book. There's, there's the book, um, as Roger was saying, and it, it, all of this information, and it, it, we'll skip over it in some ways now, we've explained it a bit, but there is masses and masses of detailing that we discovered as the whole project unfolded. And we've cataloged everything that we found in great detail, verifying and proving what we found. We haven't guessed at anything here. We've chipped away at the research until we finally uncovered all of the stones to prove things like Brewster did actually uh, release parts up to Goodyear's, um, you know, as we've mentioned on the wings, the date proving of, of, the, of the wings. Everything that you see and everything that we found on the aircraft um, has been completely verified and can be substantiated against exactly what date and point of time that, that, that they relate Terrific. to. So yeah. um, that's just another example of the colours here that were showing through on that tailplane. I thought it was worth stopping you no, just, just to no, show I you that there now. Th th this is exactly what I wanted you to do and I think it's extremely important for you know, making this as, as accurate as it can possibly be that um, I'm not an expert but, but you are and, and I'm delighted that you're here because it means that um, first of all I have a chaperone who can then horn in whenever it's necessary and, and tell me where I've gone wrong which of course I will because I'm an imperfect individual. So, well, Of course there is, um, it's very dear to the hearts of the whole team here at the Fleet Arrow Museum it wasn't just me that did this it was, it was a very very um, skilled dedicated team which, which 
yeah. in between our other museum work. We didn't just do the Corsair as a project. It fitted in between our other museum work, but it took five years sure. on and off in between our other museum work yeah. to pick and peel and rub and scrape carefully the 1960s paint away and expose everything that you see, which is totally original 1944, 45 um, paintwork and markings. So it, it's fantastic. We, we never thought that we would see the whole airplane. We expected to find maybe small areas or useful references and markings, but the more we worked on the project, the more it kept delivering. And, and we were actually astonished ourselves to find out that the whole aircraft, everything, fuselage, wings, tails, is a total time capsule aircraft waiting to be found underneath. And that's what kept us going to um, keep that five years program rolling till we till until we'd uncovered the whole aircraft sure. and yeah. we believe she she is the, the only Royal Navy complete FG1A anywhere in the world and certainly we believe she's got the most extensive original paintwork and markings no I, no, I don't think I can't there can there can't be much doubt about that to be honest with you and and, and this is why it's so important to preserve aircraft like this and I'm sure that all of you watching out there in modeling land and beyond um, will will probably agree with that so let's move along um, I'm just gonna move along Dave to the um, to the front here to the um, starboard wing section so this would be ordinarily where the pilot would enter the aircraft and from a modeling perspective on the 148 scale model what you will be able to see when you look at the inboard um, flap is a foothold here as you can see, there isn't one on KD-431, so if you want to model the, um, the authentic KD-431 aircraft, you'll need to fill that hole up, and, and you'll need to fill it up on both sides, so underneath here and through there, because there isn't one. There is a step here um, for the pilot to get in, and that is on a, on a swinging arm, so it, it would normally be sprung so that you could push it open and step onto it. But what ordinarily the pilot would do is he'd get himself up there, in some manner I suspect running jump or perhaps something like that maybe and then step into there and then into the into the cockpit from there um, uh, we'll come back to that in a second because I've got a bit of a surprise later on for you so you'll have to watch the next video for that most of the pilots I'm gonna hop in again Roger most of the pilots that we've interviewed some of which have actually flown KD-431 again we have their references documented sure. yeah um, all looked at this and scratched their heads and wondered how they used to get up to that point where you've just said about the footsteps. Uh, they had all forgotten that they were 19, 20, 21 year olds, <laughs> very fit, yeah. very, very um, enthusiastic, very ready to jump in the airplanes and fly. But that said, they all say they remember, of course, that the FT1D had a footstep hole, the FT1A didn't, the earlier ones. And you had to basically do what you've just said almost do a running jump and a clamber to hop up and, and get your leg or your knee or your foot up onto the wing and then grab for the holding points yeah. um, to pull yourself up. Yeah. So these marks, and particularly here, um, where you're not supposed to step and put your foot into the rib on the underside of the, the, the flat mechanism there, they all did. You can see it's quite extensively worn there. Um, and that's basically what they used to do is put a foot there and also yeah. help themselves onto the wing so all of these scratch marks that you see here we haven't made that look worn or give it false patina those are just the markings which we uncovered from the, the paint that we removed that's what people did in 1944-45 they they caused that wear so that's completely authentic correct yeah. scratches from people clambering to get into the oh, airplane. So of course necessity was the mother of invention and these people were keen to get into this aircraft because as I understand it, when they flew it, they loved it. So the, there is a grab handle up there. I think you might be able to see that oblong bit there, which again is sprung and allows you to be able to um, hand yourself into the aircraft. Um, and, and we will have a little look inside there in slightly more detail in, in, in another at another stage. Now, you will recall me mentioning the um, the jury strut here that prevents the the wing from from going forwards uh, or falling over on the people's head because we don't want that to happen what you will see here is the roundel is missing now the reason for that is because this canvas section here that you're looking at on the starboard wing uh, was replaced as part of the restoration and it was decided to leave the roundel um, as it was rather than to replace um, the roundel 
um, and again that's another nod to the authenticity of this whole thing um, and I think again it speaks volumes of the people here at the Fleet Air Arm Museum and the big team that did this um, and I'm going to show you one more thing on this which I want I would like you to see because you can see it in the pictures in the book but it might be nice to be able to have a look at this and that's the the, the, the painting and, and the marks that you can see with the zinc chromate primer here, which extends approximately out to um, sort of this area. Um, but you can see the scratching there and, and, and the markings where um, you know the fitters, the aircraft fitters and so on, will have got into the aircraft or got onto the aircraft to perform uh, maintenance and checking of fluids because from the top here and to refuel the aircraft as well, I would suspect. Um, so there we are. This is KD-431 and it's a completely unique piece of, of, of um, aviation history from the Fleet Air Arm, so that's the Royal Navy's Air, so, you know, the Royal Naval Air Service. Um, and it's been my pleasure to be able to present the outside of the aircraft to you today. Um, and my, my thanks goes to, to Dave Morris who wrote the book KD-431 uh, Corsair, which I urge you to take a look at. Um, and. Right now I'm going to, uh, after 30, nearly 36 minutes of, of me jabbering on, I'm going to give myself and you a bit of a rest and then I'll come back another time and we'll have a look at another part of the aircraft. So, thanks very much for tuning in everyone, this is Inzan out. Bye for now.